I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Wednesday, November 9th, 2016. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Alex Chichuleo, ninth grader at Parkville High School, Matt McCarthy from Deer Park Middle School and eighth grader, and Luke McCarthy from Sudbrook, who's an eighth grader also. We will uh, remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item for tonight's meeting is our agenda. Yep. Are there any changes or additions to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Uh, there are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed to the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is Bosch Farone. Second speaker is Ahmad Jamil. Number three is Sosan Sabai. Number four is Ying Zhu. Number five is Howard Libet. Number six is John Kantorski. Number seven is Diana Bergman. Eight is Dr. Bing Wang. That's it. All right, thank you very much. All right, moving through our agenda, our next item is our superintendent's report, and for that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, first, I want to recognize all of our educational support professionals. Today um, is Educational Support Professionals Day here in Baltimore County. We actually work with our administrators to make sure that they had unique activities at the building level to recognize all the members of ESPBC. And I want to thank Lila Mary Bloom for her leadership uh, with ESPBC. But we work with our bargaining unit to make sure that this was recognized the week before American Education Week. So thank you so much, Lila, and all of our ESPBC professionals for the work you do every single day in our schools. Um, with that being said, next week, of course, is American Education Week. All of our school buildings will be open. We are inviting our community to go out and see uh, several of our initiatives in action and see our teachers do some great teaching and learning um, with our students. So we do welcome guests to look at those innovative strategies um, in action. I want to say a special uh, thank you and congratulations to our communications uh, department. We did release last week that the Chesapeake chapter of the National School Public Relations Association recognized our communications department with 11 awards um, for really telling the BCPS story. So under the leadership of Mr. Dickerson, we've done a really, really good job. And we actually want more suggestions and feedback on how we can continue communicating with all of our audiences. As a matter of fact, our board and, I, uh, and staff just had a dinner with the Area Education Advisory Councils where we talked about um, looking at additional ways to communicate the message. So congratulations, Mr. Dickerson, to you um, and your staff. Job well done. Help me give them a round of applause. <laughs> 
as we traveled around, we've had several parents who've asked us how we might have made up days um, when we actually had to close for heat um, and how our teachers may have made up the curriculum and made those adjustments. We have worked with all of our teachers working with our academics department to adjust our curriculum pacing guides to make sure that the days that our students were affected by the heat closure, they actually made up that, um, that learning within classrooms as well too. So to our parents who wanted to know how we adjusted that, we adjusted it by adjusting our curriculum guides um, in the process. I also want to say a special thank you to uh, two board members. The first one is Ms. Johnson. Um, uh, about three weeks ago, uh, Ms. Johnson and I had an opportunity to present to the Council of Great City Schools. And this is a group of large urban school systems that really come together several times a year, uh, through, whether it's through the finance professionals, the C, um, CIOs, or the chief information officers, or whether it's the superintendents and board members. And so we actually talked about the work we're doing around equity in Baltimore County. And I think now's the time for us to focus on equity more than ever. Um, in Baltimore County through the adoption of our equity policy that this board has driven, um, through holding myself and staff accountable to academic outcomes for all children, regardless of race or gender or ethnicity, um, we were able to sort of talk about the glows and grows um, that comes with implementing such a difficult policy when you're allocating resources to individuals and students who need them the most. And I want to let this board know and this community know that Ms. Johnson did one great job doing that. Um, she was the only board member who was in that session um, who presented along with the superintendent. So thank you, Ms. Johnson, on behalf of staff and of the school system for helping us tell the equity story. And we really talked about the challenges going forward, uh, what we have to do to support our schools um, and our principals. So thank you for that work. Help me give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> And that does tell into um, me having to say a special thank you to another board member. And I will tell you, over the last four years, this individual has really helped uh, me grow, not just into a better superintendent, but also a better man. And uh, he and I have actually had some pretty um, great conversations, and I think that's the best way uh, to put it. Um, but I really am excited to say that I do consider him um, a really good friend. Um, even though he and I don't agree on every single thing. Um, but I do want to thank um, Mr. Collins for your work. I really do appreciate you, Mike. Yeah. And yeah, the public probably should know uh, Mr. Collins fusses at me more privately than he does publicly. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who don't know that, he definitely does um, do that, even though he does not return text messages when I text him. So, um, But no, thank you so much for your service to Baltimore County, to this board, to me um, and my staff. But before Mr. Collins was a board member, he was a teacher at, I'm pretty sure you all know, Kenwood High School. <laughs> Um, and 30 years and before um, Mr. Collins leaves the board, uh, Kenwood High School is scheduled for air conditioning. So thank you for your work, uh, Mr. Collins. Really do appreciate it. Um, I do also want to touch on uh, two final things. One, um, let's talk about grading and reporting uh, for a while. Um, our board will be getting a, an update at its November 21st meeting um, on grading and reporting. They'll talk about the why behind the policy. They'll talk, uh, our staff and I will talk about implementation of that policy. We'll talk about some of the things that have worked well, some of the challenges as we've gone forward. Uh, most recently, we did work with our teachers, our parents, our administrators, and our students. And we released an addendum uh, to our grading report and manual that was uh, released just most recently to our teachers. In addition, our parents and students will get a letter uh, tomorrow in their report report cards that will talk about some of the adjustments. Um, but I want to personally thank our teachers. Um, let me be clear with you. Over the last four years, we have a pretty ambitious theory of action in place in Baltimore County. Um, I do recognize the fact that Blueprint 2.0 is an ambitious strategic plan. I recognize the fact that with any strategic plan, um, as we look at implementation, there are things that we probably should have reconsidered um, as we look at any implementation. But at the end of the day, we want our goal to be the same. So as I say a special thank you to our teachers, as I thank Ms. Baton uh, for her editorial in the paper just this morning. I hope it did not get lost in all the election um, coverage. But Ms. Baden, thank you for your editorial this morning. I do want to say to our teachers that um, there were certain assumptions that I as a superintendent made that I probably should not have made around just basic vocabulary in terms of implementing this policy. And so I do regret that we did not provide you the appropriate supports to implement this. However, when we look to put stat teachers in schools, one of the things that we recognize with our school system is that professional development needed to be at the building level. And so as opposed to pulling people out to give them that support, we're pushing 
pushing that support in. This is why Mr. Burke reports directly to me, um, and this is why we provide uh, particular support through our stat teachers. But to our teachers, I promise to give you the appropriate supports you need to implement not just this policy and this initiative, but every single initiative that we put forward as a school system, because that's the value of Team BCPS. So, Ms. Baden, thank you for your leadership with TAPCO. Thank you for fussing at me just as much as Mr. Collins fusses at me, but we will continue supporting our teachers. I promise you that. It is November 22nd. It is November 22nd. I apologize uh, for that one, um, that our next board uh, meeting is. And last but not least, I do recognize that this is the last superintendent's report I have before we uh, celebrate the Thanksgiving break. Um, and as we look at our calendar, we recognize the last board meeting that I will have an opportunity to do the superintendent's report um, <laughs> before the Thanksgiving break. And so I do want to uh, say a special thank you um, to all of our folks. I always say this, but uh, time goes very, very quickly. It's the last board meeting that I have to do the superintendent's report. Ms. Williams is looking at me. Um, but I do not do a superintendent's report at the second uh, meeting. Um, but you know, definitely take some time with your family and your friends. Um, time goes by very, very quickly. Um, and you never want time to go by without you telling your family and your friends that you love them, that you support them, and that you're there for them. So Thanksgiving is a wonderful time to just allow ourselves to pause and just to thank our family and friends for being there with us. And it's always a time that I say as superintendent, thank you all for being a member of this team, which is Team BCPS. So it's a pretty long superintendent's report, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for allowing me the opportunity to give it. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, <clears throat> our next item is the chair's report, and I'll be relatively brief. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to thank all of our stakeholders who have provided input in recent weeks regarding key issues to education in Baltimore County. The Board has received important communication regarding the school calendar, the new grading manual, along with other items. As Dr. Dance mentioned, uh, the Steering Committee for Grading Guidelines recently incorporated several of the concerns presented in the amendments to the practices that will be implemented as we move forward. This topic does remain of critical concern. As Dr. Dance said, the Board will receive a presentation uh, as a full board on November 22nd, but we'll also receive an update in the curriculum meeting next Tuesday, November 15th. So again, there'll be two opportunities that the board will get an update uh, uh, regarding the uh, grading manual. Uh, the board has had the opportunity uh, to meet with the five area advisory groups to the board earlier this evening. The area advisory groups are an important liaison that provides inf an informed view of issues to uh, affecting the specific regions of the county. Um, the board has received criticism that area advisory groups have not received responses from bo the Board of Education to budget concerns and other issues, and we will work very hard to remedy that problem in the very near future. Along with other uh, school board members across Maryland, I had the opportunity to meet last week with the board of the Maryland Association of Counties. This meeting was held to discuss how Maryland boards of education and the Maryland Association of Counties might work more efficiently to address, address educational issues. Topics included a study on funding allocation for education across the state, the process used for school construction, and enhancing cost efficiencies associated with school construction. It was clear from these discussions that Maryland continues to have a strong commitment at the state and county level to provide a quality education for our students. This concludes my report for the evening. Thank you for your attention. And now we'll meet, move to our student member report, Ms. Aislinn Bratt. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to talk about the grading and reporting policy. I don't know if anyone's sensing a theme. Um, but at the last board meeting, the Baltimore County Student Council had dinner with the board, and I would definitely consider it a success. The major concerns expressed by the students and the rest of the community were also about the grading and reporting policy. And I'd just like to thank Christina Byers, Dr. Dance, and the rest of the board members um, for taking the time to answer some of the questions that the students raised um, and to address some of the concerns for the rest of the council. So that's definitely appreciated. Um, also, last time I came to the board with an update, I shared two concerns over the new policy. First was the overemphasis of testing within classes, and second was the <coughs> inequitable implementation of the redo policy. Um, the addendum submitted for inclusion in the second quarter has the express purpose of providing greater proportionality between assignment types and consistency between and among grade levels and departments within a school on redo assignments. 
The specific clarifications in the addendum provide a breakdown of how much a student's grade should be major and minor assignments and clarifies that within schools, there should be consistency in the number of opportunities, attempts, and length of time provided for redo opportunities. I feel these provisions adequately address the concerns expressed by the public and I greatly appreciate all those who work so hard in this addendum. Um, looking forward, however, I believe the real problems lay not in the substance of the policies because I believe they're of sound because I believe they're sound in concept. My concern is really in the implementation. Of the teachers who have spoken up, they are all saying the same thing, that the switch in the policy has happened too abruptly, resulting in disparate application. I know Dr. Dance um, talked about some new things that we're gonna be doing as a county, and I greatly appreciate that. And that said, I would also encourage all students or parents who feel their grades are not an accurate reflection of, their ma of the mastery of their content, due to the shift in the grading, um, that they submit their concerns to the BCPS survey found on the web page, or that they email myself or the rest of the board. So with that, I conclude my board update. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Our next agenda item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive advice from community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration, even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to re observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, I'll call upon our stakeholder group members, and our first person to speak is the president of TAB Co., Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening. Chair McDaniel, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I have pondered what to write for tonight's remarks. I, like many in this country, had a long night last night. I was barely able to sleep thinking about the consequences of this election. We are a nation starkly divided. I wonder if we will be able to turn that around anytime soon. I know one thing. Public education is the number one institution that lifts our children up from poverty and allows them to succeed as they move into adulthood. We have seen many initiatives thrown at public education from legislators at all levels of government. These various schemes, i.e. vouchers, private charter schools, et cetera, for the most part have been proven by research to not only not improve education, but to glean the parents that help neighborhood comprehensive schools work. The simple act of removing the active parents who understands the importance of education from a local school decreases parent invo parental involvement to a point where the local schools aren't able to function well. Rather than, rather than bring community schools into the mix that would encourage par parental participation and lift up everyone within the school because parent participation increases with this model, some of our politicians offer choices that are at most uh, often not effective. Just look at the bipartisan research, research that has been done by neutral organizations and fact checkers. I am glad that here in Baltimore County we are in the process of bringing community schools to our system. I am hopeful that our incoming president will be someone who really looks at the facts and ponders decisions before choosing one path or another. I would be remiss if I failed to address the grading and reporting rollout. Besides the election, it is the number one topic on my teachers' minds uh, and myself. 
Mm. While we are working constantly with BCPS officials trying to help create a much more effective and functional grading system for students, teachers, and parents, teachers need relief from the onerous and unnecessary workload created by this rollout. I trust that, that active participation by teachers providing the information necessary to make these changes will be quickly implemented. And I appreciate your remarks tonight, Dr. Dance, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is the chair of the Sp Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Megan Seward Sicken. Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. Good evening. First, of course, I want to briefly address the grading and reporting issue. Uh, the idea of using a body of evidence to assess skills can be helpful for many of our special education students. I acknowledge that steps need to be taken to address how this idea can work and how to support teachers without overwhelming them. But in the midst of many valid concerns, please don't lose sight of the very good idea that special education students and many typical students can benefit from having different ways to demonstrate understanding and we appreciate the potential of having multiple ways to measure progress and goals. Next, I want to begin to address issues of budget and staffing. We are grateful that last year, 20 new positions allowed for a number of things, including special education positions that benefited secondary regional programs. We are thankful to the board and to the Office of Special Ed for that accomplishment last year. Now that leads us to concern over staffing at the elementary level. It is a highest level priority for us to reach a minimum, a minimum of two special educators per elementary school. Depending on pre-K availability, elementary special educators cover six to eight years worth of grades. That is a huge amount of ground to cover with incredibly varied curriculum and student needs. Right now, there simply aren't enough bodies to meet the needs of all of our special ed students, both inside and outside general ed and caseloads are too large. And special ed does not exist in a vacuum. When there aren't enough resources, classroom teachers are left to fend for themselves, making accommodations or modifying curriculum on their own, which may they may not have the time or the expertise to do for every type of learner. If teachers spend too much time on that without enough support, then all other students suffer with less time and attention and teachers end up overwhelmed. I want to make clear that enough special ed staffing is good for everyone. Special ed teachers need reduced caseloads. General ed teachers need more support and resources. Special ed students need attention and typical students need their teachers to not be overloaded. In upcoming budget considerations, understand that from our perspective, additional special ed positions cannot be negotiable. Early intervention, preventative strategies, reduced caseloads, and more teacher support cannot be bargaining chips. They are fundamentals. And when there is enough special ed staffing in every school, every student, and every teacher benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Board of Education members, and Dr. Dance. I'm PTA Council um, P Communications Chair Leslie Weber, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Emory Young. PTA Council would like to thank BCPS and the Board of Education for allowing us and other stakeholders the opportunity to provide feedback at every Board of Ed meeting. We're also grateful that, as noted in policy and rule, uh, 1210, PTA Council and local PTAs and PTS, PTSAs are recognized as important partners of the board to ensure academic success for all students. Other stakeholder groups are also important partners. 
all advisory councils afford county citizens the opportunity to provide input. For example, the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council invited BCPS curriculum and instruction staff to its October 26th meeting to discuss new grading and reporting procedures. Open forums like this allow the community's voice to be heard. PTA Council has been pleased to be included in a series of meetings on revising the privacy opt-out form. Input from PTA Council and other stakeholders will make the form more precise and clear and will allow parents and guardians the ability to make more informed decisions about protecting their students' privacy. All stakeholders must have a place and a voice on the standing and steering committees and focus groups that drive the progress and, and future of the school system. As noted in this week's BCPS e-newsletter, BCPS is reviewing policy 1270 on parent and family engagement and is soliciting feedback on, on improving the parent BCPS relationship. We encourage the community to send feedback to Parent University at parentu at bcps.org as instructed in the e-news. As Dr. Dance pointed out, and as noted in a recent BCPS press release, BCPS won a number of regional honors for communications projects. The press release noted that communications is one of the four cornerstones of the BCPS Blue Blueprint 2.0 strategic plan. The press release further noted that it's part of the BCPS culture to foster timely, accurate, and engaging two-way communications to reach all stakeholders. Based on this, PTA Council advises that the, these communications be clear, concise, explicit, and timely, and that solicited community input is taken to heart. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from ESPBC, the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, and that's Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Dr. Dance. A chair, a chairman uh, McDaniels and Board of Ed. I'm here because I would like to thank you for announcing the Educational Support Professional Day on the Baltimore County website. This means a lot to my members and we really wanted to let you know. Thank you very much for your support. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, next speaker is from the area, one of the area advisory councils, uh, the Central Area Advisory Council, Ms. Amy Freeman. Good evening, board members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I chair the Central Area Education Advisory Council, and based on testimony at our recent pre-budget hearing and, community, and hearing from community members providing feedback in other ways, the primary concerns in the Central Area are, re revolve around facility issues. In, the, in addition to the need for increased funding of building maintenance for all BCPS schools, Pleasant Plains Elementary, Ridgely Middle, Dumbarton Middle, and Towson High are overcrowded. Delaney and Towson High schools are falling apart and need new schools, not patchwork renovations. Millions of taxpayer dollars are being spent to address facility issues at many BCPS schools, which is great. But serious scrutiny needs to be given to how these, this, these, this money is being used to ensure that long-term solutions are created. There are several examples in the central, central area alone of how the end results of costly projects failed to meet the needs of the school. There was the new West Towson um, Elementary School that opened overcrowded. The Stonely Elementary renovation in addition that left that school overcrowded. And more recently, with the Dumbarton Middle School renovations that are underway, not only do they not address growing enrollment at this school, but the first phase that was recently completed 
let the school with gym locker rooms that are much smaller than they were before the renovations. Barely two classes can fit into the locker rooms at one time, leaving several other classes to wait their turn and significantly impacting instruction time for those students left waiting. This problem will have to be addressed, which will likely add to the overall cost of this project and is something that should have been identified in the planning phase, not after the work was done. So while we are grateful that these projects are being funded, there are, are several concerns with regards to planning that beg the need for additional scrutiny. We look forward to hearing from Mr. Pete Dixit at our next meeting on Thursday, November 17th at Delaney High School, where the, to where the topic will be central area facility updates. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Our next speaker is from the Area Advisory Council also from the Southeast area, Ms. Jackie Brewster. Good evening. Good evening. This is my annual pre-budget um, report, so. Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts is finally scheduled to be renovated for the second time. It was beginning the process in 2009 and was moved further down the list while Carver, who has a similar magnet program, received a brand new facility. Although we are very happy that Patapsco High School is now going to be fully renovated, the renovations do not address overcrowding. Patapsco does not house the current student population and has not done so for a very long time. There are nine trailers. It is currently at 113% capacity. We are concerned that the overcrowding issue will not be able to be addressed after the renovations are completed. The original firm told us that you could not build up because it would not support a second floor. The property is surrounded by houses and therefore cannot be expanded easily. Patapsco High School scored a 1.88 on the system-wide uh, facilities report. Only Lansdale High School scored a lower than Patapsco. So if it is not replaced and only renovated, then none of the higher scoring high schools should be replaced in the future. Dundalk High School is overcrowded and has a high needs population. They are requesting additional staffing, including a guidance counselor to pupil, uh, pupil personnel worker. Dundalk High School is requesting mo money for their project Lead the Way program. They would like to purchase standard equipment for the program, such as a laser engraver. They are also asking for continued support of their Spark Academy, which has been very successful at their school. Charles Mont Elementary School uh, requested that a canopy in front of the building be replaced and to add a canopy over the pre-K and K entrance and exit area. They are also requesting money be added to the budget for replacement projector bulbs or to handle replacing projector bulbs from the BCPS technology budget through the help desk tickets. We also want to make sure that there is adequate staffing in all areas, including teachers, instructional assistants, as well as support staff like guidance counselors, secretaries, and so on. We would like to thank everyone for supporting the replacement facilities for Berkshire, Colgate, and Dundalk Elementary Schools, which are coming up in the future. Full testimony will be included in our October minutes, and thank you for listening to our, our request. I would also like to thank Dr. Dance for adding the Community Assistant Superintendent. Mr. Roberts has been very helpful, and it is great to have someone who attends our meetings, hears our concerns, and deals with issues sometimes almost immediately. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brewster. <laughs> sometimes. Some of them are much more difficult. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move into our public comment portion of the meeting. Our first speaker is Dr. Farone. Good evening to all. Uh, Good evening. Last board meeting, one religious official mentioned to you subjective data about closing the schools on one religious non-Komar holiday. 
Our community has been coming to this board for 20 years. We came in the thousands. We gave you petitions. People came in with their bodies. They sent emails and so forth. So what I am really asking you as Board of Education today, building on the story of the equity story, that when you choose whether it's option A or B or C, that you put the word diversity, equity into action. And you would not really confirm that whatever Muslim Americans do or ask for, they have no chance. We ask you for equity. Maybe last night, it was really a proof that we are a divided nation. We are divided by race, religion, ethnicities, and by wealth. But the Board of Education is really what builds this nation. And I really stuck with you for 20 years because mm. I have hopes. I really do. Five to six, for me, is a hope. I ask you for equity today. Not really talk about it. Please don't talk about it anymore. Just implement it. If you choose the option that says diversity is diversity, equity is equity, that's my mission with you. If you choose otherwise, it really confirm what others have said. It's all lip service. And I don't believe in that. I really trust in you, and I hope you will really, truly build on it tonight, and you're choosing which calendar that you'll approve. Thank you. Oh, I have 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Collins, I am truly, truly deep in my heart honored to have known you. I cannot tell you how much I really admire your positions, your political positions, your sense of diversity, your sense of doing right things, your funniness, <laughs> everything about you. And I would truly, truly miss you. Honest. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. Peace and good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, Dr. Dance, and the members of the board. Today we are here under the cloud of 11-9 and not 9-11. Mm. Uh, we were all traumatized in 9-11, <laughs> and today the 11-9, half of our citizens are traumatized, mm. and almost half of the world is traumatized as we speak emergency security meetings are taking place in Japan, South Korea, European Union, and in, amongst many allies. This uncertainty and this uh, trauma, we hope and pray that it's gonna go away soon. True democracy and one man, one vote, and not the Electoral College would have resulted something different today. When leadership fails, there is a backlash. However, whichever leadership comes, it has its own consequences. Well, I'm gonna make it very short today and say that I'm only worried about leadership here at BCPS. We've had many of my colleagues and many parents of Muslim children come here in thousands over the last 20 years. I made special effort today not for them to show up. Instead, to present to you about 900 <coughs> signatures and petitions only from the southwestern portion of Baltimore County. How do I get to you, sir? Mr. Uh, Birch will take that.
this, needless to say, has been crying out for equality for all. It's been asking for equal justice. It's been asking for no special exemptions, no special status. I commend the committee that worked so hard at it. And I've always looked up to Dr. Dance as the next generation to be the pioneers and the beacon of hope. Mr. Collins, I'm gonna miss you. Thank you. Your input, your dedication has been exemplary. And I hope that everyone can look up to him and not necessarily follow his footsteps, but move forward with greater strides. Please approve those holidays for the Muslim children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. Our next speaker is Sosan Sabai. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for letting me have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I am a resident of Baltimore County, <coughs> and I have four children going to Baltimore County Public Schools, and I'm very satisfied with the result. And um, I am a software developer, and uh, I am interested very much in education. And I love to code my ideas. Uh, after I did the training program, this is really what has happened. It is a true story. My daughter was in fifth grade. She came to me and she asked me about long division. And I was recently done with the training program to become a software developer. Uh, immediately, I opened a project, Windows desktop application, and I start uh, coding um, long division. So I designed the, the concept and designed the application and code, uh, code this application. So uh, it is called digital tutor, long division, subtraction, and multiplication with one digit. And from its name, I implied its name, and it is, I developed it to be a real digital tutor. It gives instruction in every step, and uh, it gives feedback on every keyboard that student um, achieve. So it is like a tutor or a teacher with the student. Um, and it is very detailed. Uh, the student, when he use when he use it, he does not need any outer or additional support. Um, and um, in the new update, I add to it a database. It connects the education system, the teachers, with the students, so the teacher can assign homework to the every course. You know, there is many courses of math to every course. And the, the software will grade it and give it back, give back the grades to the teacher. So um, the teacher will go back to the next, um, uh, next homework or next test or whatever. And uh, if the user does not want to use the database, there is built in. Um, uh, exercises. And, um, yeah. Just uh, couple seconds. And I'm willing to give it, uh, share it with uh, um, our students and give it to Baltimore County for free. All right. Ever, and even All right. using use database so I can take the feedback and give it, give it back to you customized. All right, thank you very much. 
Our next speaker is Jing Jing, Jing Zhu. <coughs> Did I pronounce your name correctly? That's close. That's close. How how do you <laughs> how do you pronounce? Ching Ching Chu. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jing Jing Chu, and um, I attend seventh grade at Pine Grove Middle School. I'm also president of the Baltimore Chinese School Student Council, and I'm running for uh, president at my school student council. I was born in China, and I moved to Maryland when uh, before school age. I attended Pine Grove Elementary, which is now a Blue Ribbon School. To learn English, I attended the ESOL program, and I greatly appreciate this program because it helped me with learning a completely different language. I still remember when I was in China, during the Lunar New Year, my whole family would gather together and throw a big party and a huge feast. During this holiday, we carry our traditions, like preparing traditional foods, such as dumplings, sticky rice balls, and fish. Children also receive red envelopes of money from parents and grandparents. There are also traditional Chinese performances, like the lion dance um, and the dragon dance. The Chinese decorated their homes with banners that write good fortune quotes, delicate tissue paper window art, lanterns, and the corresponding zodiac animal, and lots of red. The Lunar New Year is very important for the Chinese as well as for the Asians. There are a lot of Asian people that live in Baltimore County and their kids attend school. So we would please ask to move a professional development day on the 2018 Lunar New Year, which is on a Friday on February 16th, so Asian kids can carry on their traditions without having to make the choice between staying at home or going to school. Because after all, we know education is our priority. This will also benefit our county. It would make our county more diverse and open to different cultures. It would also make us more of, of an inclusive society. Me and many more would greatly appreciate a day off on a holiday, the, lun the Lunar New Year. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Chu, for your excellent presentation. Our next speaker is Howard Libet. Good evening, board members. I'm Howard Libin. I'm executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again about the calendar. I appreciate a number of you have followed up with me uh, from the, the last hearing with data, um, and I, I um, appreciate the difficult position you're in with the calendar. In the course of the conversations I've had with some of you, an idea has been raised that I wanted to respond to, which is the idea that we ought to have a pilot program for one year, keep the schools open, and, and let's see how many Jewish students and Jewish teachers actually take the day off for prayer to go to synagogue. In my mind, and I've been involved with the county schools off and on for over 20 years, that's the opposite of every pilot program I've ever heard of the county schools. Generally, pilot programs are about enhancing our children's education. My children attended one of the pilot schools for the new technology program. There were some rough patches there. We understood that because ultimately it was about making a better school system for everyone. The same thing if one of my children's in a grade that's piloting math or English. A pilot of keeping the schools open on a Jewish holiday to see how many students stay home and how many teachers are absent is about holding, keeping schools open to see how little learning occurs in a given day. Why would we do that? Does it really matter whether we know exactly that there's 1,000 Jewish teachers or 1,200 Jewish teachers or 1,800 Jewish teachers or whether there's 8,000 Jewish students or 15,000 Jewish students? Whatever that number is, I think we can all agree it's a high enough number to cause significant operational reasons to keep the schools closed on the Jewish high holidays. The cost to substitute teachers, the cost to learning, not just for Jewish students, but for other students in those classes with Jewish teachers would be significant. And for that reason, you have a viable calendar option in front of you that complies with the governor's order and also would keep the schools closed for Rosh Hashanah next year for students and teachers. And I would urge you to adopt that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Kantorsky. Uh, good evening, uh, board, uh, Chairman McDaniels, Dr. Dance. 
Uh, my name is John Kantorski. I am vice president of the PTA at Chapel Hill Elementary. Uh, I am coming to speak today. Um, there's been plenty of discourse uh, just right now about the calendar that is uh, being proposed for the coming year that you'll be voting on shortly. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and other parents at the school and other parents that I've uh, dealt with throughout Perry Hall in the Northeast to uh, support options B or C, uh, preferably option B since it maintains the holiday for uh, the Jewish population, Rosh Hashanah. Um, the big argument I've heard, uh, we've heard in discourse is um, uh, between spring break and summer. I feel like the, the calendar differences are basically just trading spring break for summer break. Uh, parents need to find coverage for that week of spring break, just like they do for that final week of summer for the proposed B or C calendar. Uh, there will be summer camps that will be expanded to meet that. Uh, there are probably fewer spring break camps, so parents will have an easier time to support their students uh, by removing spring break and making it just a long weekend versus the current uh, A calendar, which would maintain the full spring break we've had for years. As well, over 71% of the population supports. Uh, in a recent poll, the, um, the calendar proposed by uh, Governor Hogan, and there is no compelling evidence of any harm to the students. Uh, the board has two very viable options, and options B or C, uh, and both options are popular with our residents. I hope the board would choose either of those this evening uh, to move us forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Greetings. Good evening. Uh, Nick, did you give somebody? Okay, everybody got one. Okay, perfect. My name is Diana Bergman, and I'm here today to share our stories about an adventurous six-year-old and his day at the Maryland um, Zoo in Baltimore. Wednesday, October 19, was a beautiful day to explore a wonderful Maryland Zoo. Baltimore Highlands Elementary's first grade class had waited all month for an affordable opportunity to learn about wildlife. One particular little six-year-old boy who enjoys exploring took it upon himself to see the penguins and the Arctic foxes. He carefully watched them, read about them, and truly enjoyed his experience. However, hmm. For a good amount of time, he was extremely independent in his little adventure at the zoo. This wonderful six-year-old boy is my son, Ashton. He gave every single adult that day the scare of our lives. He wandered away from his chaperone and a group and continued to explore on his own. Our principal teacher, chaperone, and myself were completely worried. When we interview our son to ask him where, what, and why, he was completely confident fearless, and reassure all of us not to worry. His response to us all was, don't worry everyone, I got to see the whole zoo. Mm. This really had me thinking, this situation can happen to anyone, and how do we reduce the risk? I'm extremely thankful we have such a wonderful family at Baltimore Highlands Elementary. On behalf of the Baltimore Highlands family, I would like to introduce you the Chaperone Survivor Guide a bright five by seven tip card to remind chaperones the important how to how creative and independent our little ones truly are. I shared an example today on how such a scary situation can have such a positive impact when everyone works together. The principal, the teachers, the parents came to a solution to reduce the risk and set an example. Hopefully we can share today with the rest of Team BCBS our template and encourage other elementary school to create something similar. So I blew it up, and I have 50 minutes, and there's an extension to this. I'm working to get an estimate with a buddy of mine that works at the volunteer firehouse to make these vests, and the vests are reusable for all the little ones, third grade down, when they go on field trips. It should be a color school, bright on the back, the name of the school, and on the inside pocket, emergency contact number. So um, I'm hoping that this would take off. It'll be implemented for the first time in Baltimore Highlands on November 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bing Wang.
Good evening. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, our dear chairman, Ms. Daniel, and Mr. Gailis, and uh, Dr. Dance. My name is Dr. Bing Wang. It's my first time to be here and make the public comments. I'm honored to be here. And uh, I'm the last one. I think I'll give some very, like, uh, easy topic and uh, thank you for your like great works and the contribution to school our education in Baltimore County as a parents of the my um, students here I'm so honored you did a great job here and uh, um, I think that the uh, Thanksgiving is coming and uh, uh, I wish you have a great holiday with your family members and uh, today I also want to talk about another very important holiday for Asian people and I think just now, like uh, Juju already speak to this topic. <laughs> I just want to reinforce here, as a parent, I really want to them to enjoy this, uh, you know, holiday. It's not only for their like, uh, uh, their like uh, uh, values of their family members, also for their like, uh, uh, the cherish their like uh, traditional values and the perspectives. And uh, this holiday had a long period, over three three thousand years, and. Uh, it's billions of people in the world celebrate this like holiday. And uh, the very important thing like the uh, Thanksgiving, the whole family members can gather together and uh, enjoy that uh, reunion, like, uh, you know, together have great dinner and have a very, like, uh, uh, fantastic the, uh, entertainment and can enjoy the TV show, everything. And I hope the students can, you know, have a great opportunity, like stay with their family members and enjoy this uh, once year opportunity. And uh, I'm so glad that the, uh, th there are tremendously increased the uh, Asian population in Baltimore County. And uh, you can see like over 10 to 20% the students in the Baltimore County sc public schools. I wish they have like this public school holiday. They can celebrate, you know, celebrate this holiday with their fam uh, family members. And uh, I think these are practical. You can see that in the uh, Mount McMurray County and Howard County, they already established the holidays for their students. I wish public, uh, the Baltimore County can take action and make this uh, holiday as uh, you know, the uh, realistic in 2018. As in 2018, like the uh, February 16, the Junish, like uh, Lunar New Year. And uh, we can use the uh, professional day or snow days as a compensation for like, uh, you know, the holidays. I wish that you can consider this like a proposal. I wish that it can be come true in 2018. Thank you for your consideration. Have a great evening. Thank you. All right, our uh, next agenda item is unfinished business, uh, proposed school calendar for 2017-2018, and for that I'll call Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Um, we've heard from several um, stakeholders tonight as well as through um, the last few board meetings um, regarding the calendar for the 2017-18 school year and back at the October 11th board meeting you had three recommendations that were presented to you for the 17-18 school year. Since that time um, Governor Hogan made an amendment to his original executive order wherein option A is no longer a viable option for Baltimore County. Uh, with that option, um, in order to be granted a waiver to start prior to Labor Day, a school system must show that they were um, out of school for inclement weather, natural civil disasters for at least 10 or more days during um, two of the last five school years. We do not meet that requirement, um, so as a result of that, um, the only options that are now available would be options B and option C. All right. Thank you. Um, before I ask for a motion, is, are there any further questions from the board? I mean, we could uh, present a motion of one of the options and then have discussion about that. Uh, Ms. Causey? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to propose a motion to accept uh, proposed calendar 27-2018 option B, a post-Labor Day start for students. All right, that's been moved to uh, accept option B. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been second. Is there any discussion at this time? Yes, Ms. Causey. Mr. Chair, I'd like to speak to my motion. 
Um, as with many other layers of laws, federal, state, and local, I think that we should comply with Governor Hogan's executive order. As Dr. Mayo pointed out, that does remove the uh, previous option A. Um, also to point out that the stakeholders uh, want this option. There's the Goucher study where over 70 percent of Maryland's population, their citizens, want a post-Labor Day start. Just recently, um, there is a um, survey that was sent to us by the Perry Hall uh, community and a very great graphic that they uh, presented to us where it shows that 85 percent of their stakeholder group would prefer that post-Labor Day start. Um, also, I just wanted to say um, that I represent the 3rd District, which comprises over 200 square miles out of the Baltimore County 600 square miles. And uh, that represents the rural, um, a very rural area, and it's designated that way by the county. And it does contain our agricultural magnet program at Hereford High School. So it's important uh, also the post Labor Day start for our families and students that are involved in agriculture. So I would ask the board members to consider that uh, as well. There's other comments that I think people would like to make to support that motion. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Johnson. So I'll be supporting um, option B as well, but I'd wa I want to make it clear that had we not been mandated, mandated to have option A, had we had the waivers available, I would have picked option A because I want to keep Rosh Hashanah in and I would also would have wanted to keep the professional development day for, e for the um, Eid al-Adha on September 1st. Uh, Mr. Collins. Just very quickly. Uh, I think uh, I very much appreciate the comments of our, our of our Muslim uh, board attendees who have, who have indeed become friends of mine and I'm, uh, to me personally about my advocacy on their behalf, and um, <clears throat> I very much don't want to see us begin the process of eliminating uh, religious holidays uh, from the calendar. So I prefer B over C for that reason. I don't want my vote to be misinterpreted as not caring about the inclusion of the Muslim holidays. And in recent times, we've had um, over the last maybe three uh, months, I lose track of time a little bit, um, we have uh, some consideration being asked as well for the, uh, the Lunar New Year, uh, that would just something to be considered as well. Uh, I realize that constraints we have on time, given the uh, executive orders of the governor relative to start and stop dates, but I still think there ought to be a creative way to work these things out, and um, therefore I think of B or C, uh, I think it's a better option for us to uh, include, rather to vote for and um, include Rosh Hashanah as a school and offices closed day, um, but I want to make sure that everyone understands that my reason for doing so is because I think um, I don't want to take a step backward in the area of those holidays, which I think this might be if we chose C. So I hope you'll support B as well. Ms. Miller. Um, I think that all of the board members, and, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but for, from what I've been hearing, um, support having uh, fair uh, inclusion of all religious holidays on the calendar, um, but we do have a legal obligation to meet as well, um, which is that we have to be able to have uh, a justification for that, and that requires data. And to be consistent with how I voted uh, in the first consideration of the calendar of the Jewish holidays, I would support option C um, until such time that the PRC develops a policy which addresses um, closures for all religious holidays and that we have that data to support that. Um, I think at that point we could come back and amend the calendar to reflect that new policy. So um, I would urge my fellow board members to vote against option B. And then uh, I would make a motion to support option C. Um, along those lines, I'll speak now. Um, I also am inclined to support option C. Um, I was impressed by Mr. Duke's uh, information on how many days we've closed over the last few years. And um, option C does 
offer or builds in more inclement weather days. And um, I think, again, if we use the same type of philosophy in future years, um, on years where Labor Day starts later, like on the 6th or 7th of September, we're going to be even more crunched to get the number of educational days in that period before uh, the June 15th closing. So I uh, am supporting the calendar that has provisions for most uh, school days and school teaching. So I would support item uh, option C for that reason. Uh, Mr. Yulfelder. Um, let, me, let me be clear and just make a couple of statements. Number one, the law is very clear. You can't close schools for religious holiday. And this is, this is not a matter of religious equity. It's a matter, pure and simple, of economics. And I, I support B because if you support C and you open the schools up on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you cost the system several hundred thousands of dollars. That's just pure and simple. No other reason you disrupt the educational process and you cost our school system considerable amount of money. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams. Um, I just would like to say that I will be supporting option B. However, I am um, disappointed that B does not incorporate um, a professional development day on September 1st that would have um, allowed uh, schools to have been closed for the EADS. Um, I think that could have been accomplished by shortening the winter holiday break, um, but that was not one of our um, proposals. So what we have before us is what we have before us at this time. All right. And yeah, Mr. Gillis. So I think from uh, listening to all the board members, it's obviously a difficult situation which has been uh, placed upon us by the governor's um, uh, directive. Um, and the competing forces which uh, are upon us are, as sometimes uh, as articulated by Ms. Baton, the need for professional development days. Uh, surely, uh, knowing our winter history, the need for snow days or inclement weather days. Um, and, and as um, Mr. Ulfelder commented, the practical impacts uh, that have been articulated by Mr. Libet are real as well. Um, I think that uh, B is probably the one that best addresses these issues when we balance all of the competing forces that the governor has, um, has made us uh, uh, struggle with. Um, the, um, we can't, uh, addressing one of Ms. Williams' comments, we can't shorten the winter holiday because the education article says we have to be closed on those days. Um, so we're handcuffed very substantially by the education article, and we don't have a lot of flexibility left um, uh, based upon the uh, governor's order. Thank you. Well, if I can add to that, one of the challenges, you know, maybe we should be um, trying to seek legislation to change that, and that's my point. All right. Mr. Stewart, yes. Yeah. I, I just want to echo that. I mean, things like I think we can agree maybe we should have a conversation about whether that can't be an opportunity for our kids to be in school and to use those days or day elsewhere. Um, this is a larger conversation than just what's before this board. Right. And I th again, uh, along those lines, I think Easter Monday could be another day that could be uh, used for education um, that we have a state mandate to take. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've listened uh, very tentatively, and I, I, there really are very compelling reasons uh, for whatever option um, uh, has been proposed. We've only had three of them. I would very much like to see, uh, as my colleague Romaine has suggested, that perhaps there be some other options, uh, because the fact is none, none of these options are perfect, and um, this is not an effort on anyone's part to, at least I can speak for myself anyway, to diminish. Um, it's just a sense of my own that None of them are sufficient for uh, making everyone happy. Um, of the three, I think C probably does the, does the least uh, harm, and I don't even characterize it as a harm. I think it has the least disadvantages. Uh, I think um, the quantification as to 
uh, dollars. It seems almost uh, uh, unseemly to reference two topics such as that together, but uh, that is in a, in a magistrate, federal magistrate's opinion. That notwithstanding, um, uh, I'd be supporting C to the uh, uh, exclusion of the other two. Thank you. Are there any other, Ms. Quasi? I just wanted to make uh, an additional comment about the uh, post-Labor Day start. Um, I have a little map here, and it, it, it indicates the average weather temperatures in Dundalk uh, across the different months. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that July is the hottest month, followed only by August. So starting in September, post-Labor Day, will be a help to all of those students in our school system that will still be without air conditioning starting in, in August and September of 2017. I believe the number was 13,000 students. Dr. Dance um, will still be without air conditioning if we're able to complete our very um, aggressive timeline, which we're very grateful to our facilities uh, and operations folks that are driving those construction projects. So that's just another reason that it would be important for our school system in this year to have a post-Labor Day start. Thank you. Ms. Bratt, did you have a comment? I just had um, more of a point of clarification. Should we, should PRC or should we later decide to readdress the calendar issue? Is it possible to amend this before next school year? Okay. For example, if we come to... Okay. Absolutely, the board can amend it. However, by rule, we always say to our public, we're going to get it out the first being in November so that families have an opportunity to plan. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. I think uh, each board member has had an opportunity to express their thoughts, and we have a motion on the floor to accept option B. <coughs> and for the vote, I'd ask Ms. Decker to please uh, call the roll so we get a good count. Ms. Quasi? Yes. Yes. Mr. Birch? Nay. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Bratt? Yes. Mr. McDaniel? No. Eight. So the motion carries. Thank you very much. So we have option B as in boy for our 2017-2018 calendar. Gentlemen, thank you very much. All right, you stay. Our next item is uh, new business, personnel matters. Dr. May is already at the table, so we'll move ahead. Um, Dr. May. Personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, certificated appointments, and area education advisory council appointments. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in items J1 through J6? been moved and second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Our next item is administrative appointments, and I'll talk, turn that over to Dr. Dance. Chairman McDaniels, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal Mar State's Elementary Schools. Coordinator of Social Studies of Elementary in the Office of Fine Arts and Social Studies, and Coordinator of Strategic Planning in the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K? I move. Second. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> if not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Oh, Ms. Scozzi. Same. All right. Thank you. Um, one abstention, Ms. Kazi, the motion passes. Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels and members of the board. I'd like to introduce two members who are currently members of our team and one who's a new member. First, for the assistant principal position at Mars Estates Elementary School, currently right now a classroom teacher at Norwood Elementary School, that's Don Peake. <laughs> Don, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations, Chris. You can stand up so we can recognize you, too. <laughs> Congratulations again. 
Next is for the coordinator of social studies for elementary in the Office of Fine Arts and Social Studies. Currently right now a history teacher at Lock Raven High School. That's Michael Christmas. <laughs> Michael, congratulations to you. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Christina, please stand up. Congratulations to you. And last but not least, the coordinator of strategic planning in the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment. Currently right now, the Deputy Director of Research and Information Systems for the Maryland Department of Commerce. That's James Palma. <laughs> and James, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations. Welcome to the team, James. We're really glad you're here. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Yeah. For you, yeah. Our next agenda item is new business. That's action taken in closed session. And for that, Mr. Nussbaum will lead us through. Sometimes it happens, man. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a, a confidential student matter in a quasi-judicial capacity. And the board also considered a matter brought to you by the Ethics Review Panel. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to confirm that action, the actions taken in closed session in those matters, which were uh, Summary Affirmance 17-17 and Ethics uh, Review Panel Complaint Number 01. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Miller? What does it mean to approve the action? Just, just confirm that it, it just occurred? just confirms that the action occurred in closed session. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Thank you, and the orders are on the desk. Thank you. All right, our next item is new business, contract awards, and for that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, the budget, uh, budget, the <laughs> building and contract committee uh, met previously and uh, discussed the 14 contracts that are before you in uh, item M of our agenda and recommends uh, to this entire board approval of contracts M1 through M14. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, do I have a motion to approve items, is it M or N? I. I1 through I7? I have M. M as in Mary. All right, M1 through M14. Do I have a motion to approve those items? Yes, yes you may. Uh, I, why don't you go? You'll probably have more <laughs> than I will. That was, my, that was my same point. I'd like to separate uh, M3, M, M10, Excuse me. Uh, and item M12. M12. M1 and M9 to that. Okay. All right, then I'm going to ask for a motion to approve items M2 <coughs> through M8. And two, two, four, two, four, two, five, six, seven. There you go. All right, I'd like a motion to approve items two, four, five, six, seven, eleven, thirteen, and fourteen. Eight. 8, 11, 13, and 14. Sarah, I need a mo motion. All right, it's been moved. We don't need a second. Any discussion on those items? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Those items carry. So let's, I'll start with the lowest number. I have an M1 that we separated. I don't know if that was Ms. Miller, okay. I just had some questions on that. Um, currently, are students paying for those tests themselves as they as they take them? Uh, no. <clears throat> so what what is changing about this? Uh, what we are doing is to uh, adjust the spending to include the 
uh, SAT day, which um, in addition to the other uh, tests here uh, represents the largest uh, single expenditure in the group of tests. And um, ensures that we're, we have the authority uh, to spend w at least the $526,000 that we spent in FY16 with the College Board and allows for student enrollment growth as well in future years. Okay. And can you tell me what are the trends as far as um, taking the SAT? Are they going up? They are they moving to the ACT or what's uh, happening? That it would have to defer to Dr. Brown uh, to respond. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ms. Moore. Um, our participation rates have remained relatively stable for PSAT, roughly, um, it varies by grade level, but our participation rates are um, in the mid 80% to up to 89%. For SAT day, our participation rate since 2012-13 uh, has increased, but has been stable over the last three years. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on M1, Ms. Causey? Mr. Saris, if you could just clarify that the um, uh, the approval of contract modification that we require, that we were provided, s made a statement about in addition the college board provides the accelerator program to evaluate college readiness, but that BCPS does not in fact pay for that and we are in fact not using that, is that That's correct? correct. Uh, we would like to correct the exhibit as you described to indicate um, uh, to remove that line because it is not uh, applicable in this instance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, oh, go ahead, Ms. Bratt. I'm sorry, just to clarify, there, the accelerator program in all of its references are being removed? It's no longer part of this particular contract? That's my understanding is that uh, the accelerator program is a data analysis tool and that uh, our staff does its own analysis of this test data. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other um, questions, I'd like to ask for a motion to accept item M1. So moved. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? M1 carries. So the next item is M3. And again, I'm not, that's for Ms. Causey, I believe. Yes, uh, I had submitted questions in advance um, of the meeting. And I uh, just wanted to point out that the um, Contract modification relative to the web hosting and mass notification system. If Mr. Sayers could just explain that a bit um, with the questions that, to answer the questions that I had previously asked. So, um, the question, uh, I'm going to just go through these questions. Um, why assign this contract from Sharp School to West Corporation? Uh, that is because uh, West Corporation has acquired all the assets of Intrafinity Incorporated doing business as Sharp School and we are otherwise uh, satisfied with their performance. Please explain how this integrates with BCPS1, individual school websites, sports schedule websites, others. Offices and schools um, are built using this content management system. Uh, office and school websites can be linked from various locations within BCPS1. All schools, teachers, departments, and groups in the system uh, will use this web content management system to build their sites. Uh, question, given controversy over inappropriate teacher postings of student images to social media, what will be the control mechanism for these web pages? Uh, trained central office and school webmasters are the only ones able to post new content. Will there be a specific opt-out for parents not wishing their students' images 
or work posted on any web page. Uh, we believe that Rule 602, 6202 Form A allows parents this option. Who in BCPS will be able to initiate messages and how is that decided? Only the chief communications officer and school administrators can initiate messages due to the need to access personal information and the board will not be able to initiate messages. Thank you. And I did want to point out that um, in the mass notification system that provides the verbal um, messages, messages can be delivered uh, in the personal voice of the sender and through text to speech and can be recorded and delivered in multiple languages. And I think that's really a great part of this um, system. Uh, the languages that will be available are Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, Burmese, Urdu, and Nepalese. That will really add to uh, the enhancement of communication for our English language learner families. Um, so I, I'm going to move to uh, support this. Okay. Ms. Uh, Miller. Uh, you might have answered this already, but I, I'm looking at this as maybe something that can be used to avoid that social media posting, you know, as a secure place to do that. It, is this is something that can be used by teachers? And I think you answered it, but well, I didn't quite catch that. Um, a department, a school, a teacher, a principal, an office can uh, establish a website. Um, those, uh, the latitude that we have there is going to be um, limited in the future as we make the effort to uh, ensure that our website is uh, compliant with the Office of Civil Rights access provisions due to individuals with disabilities and so forth. But yes, uh, within our uh, foregoing constraints, uh, everyone will be able to post content that's approved. Okay, thank you, that's good to know. All right, All right if there are no further questions, I'd ask for a motion to accept item M3. So moved. All right, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Item M3 is carried. Next item is M9. Can you explain what the purpose is of this reporting and uh, what is it going to show us that existing data does not? Um, well, we hope that in cooperation with MSDE, and the uh, three other school systems uh, that will be able to better align the student achievement data that we currently have for comparability so that we're um, uh, better able to know, compare apples to apples when we're looking at test results. That's my layperson's understanding and Dr. Brown certainly feel free to add to that. Um, and who will the data be shared with? Uh, these four agencies and MSDE. Um, now this is just the uh, system. So is there other costs that are going to be involved in this pilot study? Uh, not to my knowledge, other than whatever staff time we're already employing to gather test data and assemble it. And how is this, because it's being called a pilot, how is that going to be analyzed going forward? How are we going to analyze its value? Well, we and, and MSDE will be the, MSDE has asked us to do, to do this and they'll be evaluating the results primarily. <laughs> but we're paying for it, right? All of these agencies, yeah, are paying for it. All right. So when we call it a pilot, pilots typically you get some kind of results before you do an expansion. So that's what I'm, I'm getting at. How are we going to determine that? Um, I'll defer to Dr. Brown if he would care to explain the details of the study. So with ESSA, uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking at is the measurement of growth. And there are a variety of ways to measure growth. 
this company, SAS, has the longest track record of doing this work. They have done this in a variety of other states. They are getting ready to, to do this work in Virginia as well. Um, it is the ro most robust growth model that exists at this point in time. Um, the objective here is to um, lead the state in demonstrating an example of how we can analyze growth and how we can use that to inform our schools about students who are growing not just at, at, at the low end of the, the continuum, but also at the upper end. Uh, something that doesn't show up typically on an achievement measure because those students are simply hitting the high mark to begin with and it's hard to demonstrate growth with them if you don't have a robust growth uh, monitoring tool. Again, 20 years, 20 plus year track record with doing this type of analytic work in a variety of states around the country. Okay, and I'd just like to make a comment about piloting in general. Um, so often the first time we hear about a new initiative within BCPS is when there's a contract in front of us. And I kind of feel like we're missing a step there where the board should be informed about a new initiative and understand it and be able to ask these kinds of questions prior to asking for the money. You know, I feel like we're communi communicating by check. So I, that's just something I'd like the whole system to really think about is the board really needs to be informed about new initiatives and then the contract, you know. So thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, so looking at this contract, I want to thank you for bringing it forward. Um, this is a massive system and the, the, the amount of time that we are given to read the contracts is enough for me. So thank you. I don't, I don't need to micromanage the system. What I am thankful for is the fact that we are taking all these tests and we hear from our teachers that we're testing, testing, testing. Where is the growth? Where, wh where are my children progressing? Um, and so with, you know, even I can speak personally. So it might, if my child's in an honors class, should I keep him in an honors class and move him to GT or, or ask for a request for AP? And it's all just kind of been school-based, teacher-based, my own opinion, his input. So to actually have some, um, some data there is going to be very helpful. So thank you. <coughs> Ms. Kazi. And I did just want to say that um, I agree. I think this is going to be a wonderful analysis of uh, the testing that has been done and possibly give us some indicators of what to do uh, for future testing requirements um, because there is talk of uh, around the partnership for assessment and readiness for college careers, our, our favorite park testing. I'm being sarcastic. Um, so uh, in the um, Building and Contracts Committee meeting that we held earlier, uh, it was indicated that the board would receive a report um, about this study. And I just wanted to confirm that with you, the time frame. You said it would be before the summer. So they take, um, for first time clients, it takes them 10 to 12 weeks to turn it around once they have the data. Now this requires data from multiple systems, so I don't have control of, over all of that. Uh, so the timeline there is driven by once they have the data and they have the data um, in a fully workable format. Great. Thank you very much. And, and, and to um, Ms. Johnson's point, it will be disaggregated so we can see what's happening with our different student populations and the teachers then will be able to use that. Oh, they slice and dice this in a, a whole host of ways. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, if there are no additional questions, uh, I'd like a motion to accept item M9. All right, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? The motion carries for item M9. The next one was M10. I think that's Ms. Causey. Yes, thank you. Um, I just did want uh, Mr. Sarris to have the opportunity, since this is such a large contract for $4 million, to um, explain as he uh, so nicely did in our building and contracts meeting that we held earlier today so that uh, the rest of the board members and uh, the community can understand the reason for this. Uh, yes, yeah, so for the um, 188 relocatable units um, that are owned by BCPS, uh, this contract will provide uh, the movement from year to year um, and from capital project to capital project if necessary uh, to accommodate shifts in enrollment 
and disruptions due to uh, construction of new facilities. Um, the uh, uh, previous uh, contract um, spent over seven and a half years, about $4.3 million. Um, and uh, approximately 17% of these expenditures were uh, from the capital budget and 83% from the operating budget. Um, the, uh, the 42 other units that we have in service are leased, and the lease contract includes any uh, necessary services for uh, moving those relocatables to accommodate shifts in enrollment, and um, this contract has been awarded to four different vendors, and we will only uh, call upon and use their services as needed uh, because we are constantly adjusting the need to, uh, or our data upon which uh, enrollment is accommodated throughout the system. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yoko. One, one fast comment. Um, this $4 million is over <coughs> five years, so it's about 800000 a year. Uh, if any of you visited the Milford Mill Academy when it was under construction, you would have noticed the huge amount of reloca rel relocatables out in the front. And they weren't singles that we mainly look at. They were huge structures. As that project was completed and Pikesville came on board, those were moved over to Pikesville. And if you see the size of them, uh, you'll understand why it's an expensive proposition <laughs> to move them from location to location. And with the robust um, construction that we have over the next five years, uh, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that um, we will spend this money in moving these units around from new, new site to new site and so forth. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Pratt. Yeah, just one quick question. So I noticed the figure for seven years was approximately the same as it is for the five-year contract now. Is that because of the ongoing construction projects? Yes, the okay. accelerated pace of our capital program. And so this will not be continued past the five-year contract? Is this not anticipated to? Well, in five years, the need for these services will decrease, um, but we will still be able to use this contract for that period of time. And um, and if any changes, if for any reason it would need to be increased, we would come back to the board for additional authority. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There <clears throat> no further questions. I'd ask uh, a motion to approve item M10. <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Item 10, the last uh, item is M12. I think uh, Ms. Causey asked for that. Yes, Sarah could just explain the reason for the uh, modification, which is the increasing the amount of the contract by $203,000. Uh, this request is for the additional work that is needed at Chase Elementary School. The air conditioning project is complete. As part of the project, we did not have these six units that were functioning okay during the time of construction and design. But since then, uh, there is increased incidence of maintenance needed, and we have some funds available that we can use to replace it. Thank you. I appreciate you all doing that. All right. There are no further questions. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve item M12. So moved. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. M12 is approved. I think those are all our contracts for tonight. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next agenda item is new business, privately funded 7330 project. And uh, for that, we'll call Mr. Roberts forward. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Daniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Gantz. Members of the board, 
Tonight, I bring forward for your approval a privately funded capital improvement project for the revitalization of the upper playground, that's third through fifth grade, at 7th District Elementary School. This project will add new playground equipment and remove older existing equipment from the site. The project is in line with BCPS policy and rule 7330. In accordance with this policy, the, pro the request has progressed through all normal internal processes for review. The cost is $27,948.57, all of which the 7th District PTA Elementary has raised for this purpose. The company installing the equipment is Game Time Cunningham uh, Recreation. The Office of Physical Education has approved these modifications. Two older pieces of equipment, a climber and a horizontal ladder, will be removed and a new climber installed. The equipment is certified by the International Play Equipment Manufacturers Association. And the time for completion of this project is approximately five weeks from the approval date. This evening we have 7th District staff and community members in attendance in support of this project. So I'd like to introduce Mrs. Heather Denmeyer, the principal of 7th District Elementary School, Ms. Cynthia Hall, past president of the 7th District Elementary School PTA, Danielle Cabral, vice president of the PTA at 7th District Elementary, and Ms. Nicole Smith, PTA committee member. Could they all stand so we could see them back there, please? Thank you. Hey. Thank you. So with your approval, we will move forward with the playground revitalization project at 7th District Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Um, I would ask them for a motion to approve the revitalization project for the playground at 7th District Elementary School. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and second. Is there any discussion at this time? If not, I'd ask all those in favor to... Oh, a parent of uh, students that have played soccer at 7th District and have played on the playground and run all around, uh, and be on behalf of all the other parents, um, we just want to thank you, the PTA and the school system working together to accomplish this because it's, it's going to be a great project. So we really do appreciate the parents advocating and the school system working together. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, all those in favor then, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. <laughs> All right, our next agenda item is new business, a report on proposed central area elementary school boundary. And for that, I'll call Dr. Brown, Mrs. Kalser, and Mr. Cropper forward. Oh, Ms. Dr. <laughs> I'm so, oh, I'm so. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, all right, Dr. Knox and Mr. Cropper. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, do we have a clicker for? Let me get a drink. So good evening, Chairman um, McDaniel, <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Gillis, members of the board, and Dr. Nance. The boundary change recommendation that we are presenting this evening is part of the final steps in reestablishing the magnet program at Cromwell Valley Elementary School. Unlike other boundary changes in recent years that have been directed toward relief of overcrowding, this boundary change process was focused on maintaining an elementary magnet option in the central area of Baltimore County Public Schools, while at the same time recognizing and honoring what had traditionally been the neighborhood access area for the school since the time the magnet program was established in 1994. The traditional neighborhood access area, or the Walker area, gave families the option to attend Cromwell Valley through the priority placement provision in the magnet process, or they were able to attend their zone school, which, was Hampton El which is Hampton Elementary School. In an effort to eliminate exclusive placement provision and create more equitable access to school choice options across the school system, in 2015, Baltimore County announced its goals to reestablish the magnet program at Cromwell Valley that welcomes students from a limited neighborhood attendance area through the standard enrollment process, as well as from the region, across the region, through the magnet process. 
In 2016, BCPS began the boundary change process that we are here to report to on this evening. In accordance with Baltimore County Public Schools Board of Education Policy 1280, BCPS supports a boundary study process that fully engages the community and shares information about the process as it unfolds openly with all stakeholders. The Boundary Study Committee for the Cromwell Valley and Hampton Elementary School boundary change process met over the last two months. Tonight, we are presenting their recommendation that satisfies the goals and objectives on this boundary change. Here to share with you information about the boundary process and the Boundary Committee's recommendation is Matthew Cropper from Cropper GIS. Thank you. Chair McDaniels, members of the board, Dr. Dance, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I am here to give an overview of the process that uh, for the Cromwell Valley Elementary and Hampton Elementary Boundary Study on behalf of the committee. This process uh, was, in, was, was compiled of four phases. The, the planning phase was between April and August, and that's where the superintendent initiated the boundary process. Um, orientation was held for principals and communicated with the community to give them an understanding of what was upcoming. The staff uh, and the consultant, uh, Cropper GIS, prepared data and information in preparation for work with the committee um, that was upcoming. And then the committee was convened. The boundary study process occurred with the committee between September and October of 2016. Uh, that brings us to where we are today, which is the Board of Education uh, part of the process, which will be between November and December 2016. And then the new boundary implementation process uh, will occur between January and August of 2017. The overall goals for this boundary change process were um, there's a new magnet program at Cromwell Valley Elementary School that will welcome students from both a newly created neighborhood attendance area via the standard enrollment process, as well as across the region via the magnet application process. So there's two different components of how students are assigned to the school. The new Cromwell Valley Elementary School boundary is intended to be limited in size and walkable. So one of the, one of the goals of this committee was to create a boundary around the Cromwell Valley Elementary School where students could safely walk to school but then also have um, provide space for the magnet application process as well. The boundary study, uh, as the committee was working through, they were looking, they were focused on the policy in Rule 1280 as they were establishing and identifying potential boundary options. Um, as I said, the new Cromwell Valley Elementary School is intended to be limited in size and safely walkable, which uh, this, this committee focused on. There were nine members on the committee, two principals were, uh, were on the committee, and they were participants in the process, but they were not voting members of, of the committee. There were six teachers and parents and, um, on the committee, and principals worked with community to identify one teacher and two parents from each of the, um, the, the affected schools. In addition to that, the chair of the Central Area Educational Advisory Council sat on the committee. The committee was supported by uh, the community superintendent, facilitated by our, our firm, Cropper GIS Consulting, and it was assisted by administrative staff and, um, and supported by a specialist in collaborative engagement, which was a new part of the process in 2016. The committee met four times between September and October 2016. They looked at the, um, the, the what we call planning blocks or the small building blocks for redistricting for the area to, to make sure that they everybody was in agreement with the, the, the planning blocks that were used to help build uh, viable boundary options. They discussed and reviewed multiple scenarios through the course of, their, of the meetings with the committee. And they also used the school district website, uh, email, and interactive maps to review an, options and collaborate between meetings. Um, all of this information was also made um, available via the public, and so the public could also follow the process. Um, Cromwell Valley and Hampton Elementary School sent letters to all families in June 2016 regarding the boundary change process and followed up by notice in school newsletters and other outreach. Um, the public were invited to attend all committee meetings um, as observers. 
and all the meetings were streamed live on the on the BCPS website. And as I mentioned, all the information materials that were shared with the committee were made available to the public uh, via the website. The public were invited to provide input throughout the process via email and also via the website. So there was a comment form on the website uh, where, where the public could give us feedback as the process matured. Um, in addition to that, the committee held a public information meeting that had approximately 20, 20 people in attendance. Um, there were 54 total unique respondents who uh, participated in the online survey. Um, and this was a small, smaller process. There were only two schools involved, and so, um, and so that it wasn't, um, we didn't have any, any, any caution with the, the size of the sample. Um, the, in, as the committee was working through the process, they considered seven scenarios overall through the course from start to finish. They thoughtfully reviewed and discussed all the materials and public emails with a focus on the boundary study considerations. And they recognized that no single scenario will satisfy the boundary study considerations equally. Um, they, they selected, uh, from the seven scenarios, they selected options to, to present at a public information and via survey. So they narrowed the scenarios down to a smaller set of options to, to share with the public. As they, um, they thoughtfully considered input from the public, They thoughtfully considered input from the public information session and the survey. So once the public information session was completed, we regrouped with the committee and shared the feedback that was received. Um, the final options that were considered at the public information were options A through D, which are represented on the following slides. So A is, um, it was the first map that the, the boundary study uh, had considered, and you see the pink background is the new, would be the potential new Cromwell Valley Elementary School boundary. Um, and this, this coincided with what has been referred to historically as the current uh, Cromwell Valley ES Walker area. Option B has a little bit of a, a, a little bit of an extension to what option A was in that there was a block of homes along Goucher Road that were included in, in the, uh, the boundary for Cromwell Valley because this, this block of homes was, had, was determined to be safely walkable to the school, so they included it in this option. Option C is, a bound, is, is another uh, configuration for the Cromwell Valley Elementary School, but uh, option C did not include planning blocks that were south of Cromwell Bridge uh, Road and also um, a, a, an apartment complex that was accessible um, off of Goucher Boulevard and it sits south of Providence. Um, and these blocks had been discussed in, in, some, in some detail, and in these areas had been determined to, uh, there was limited access to sidewalks, and there were uh, dangerous crossings for students to safely be able to, to prevent them from safely crossing over streets, and so they felt that option C was an option to, to consider. And option D looks very similar to option C, but it, but it excluded the, the, the row of homes up on Goucher Road. So the committee's recommendation was option C. Um, they, con they considered all input and information developed throughout this process. Um, and they were focused on creating a boundary for the Cromwell Valley Elementary where students could safely walk to school. Um, they had many discussions with the Office of Transportation um, and, and, and with staff and teachers in talking about this. A lot, we've all went through the area and drove down the roads to look at them. Um, they, they did vote unanimously on option C, um, but they did want to express uh, some, some concern about the areas, the homes south of Cromwell Bridge Road. They really wanted those homes to be included inside the Cromwell Valley Elementary School boundary, but um, after talking and, and thorough examination with the, um, with the staff, it was determined that there was not a, there's not a, it's not a safe condition for students to cross over Cromwell Bridge Road as it currently exists. So they did want me to share that. They had some heartburn over those blocks south of uh, Cromwell Bridge Road, but they did in the end vote on option C, which excluded those uh, because with the focus on the ultimate safety of students as uh, a walk for a walkable situation. 
And the final slide shows you the recommendations. So this is the uh, recommendate, recommended boundary for Cromwell Valley Elementary School. And it should be noted that any, any student within this uh, block can safely walk to school. And they, they certainly explored uh, extending it larger, but this, this is the area that, that was determined to be safely walkable for uh, Cromwell Valley Elementary School. A little preview on the demographics and the impacts. You can see the, the capacity is listed and the enrollment, as well as the recommend, recommendation estimated enrollment. Um, Cromwell Valley would have a, uh, an en recommended enrollment of 386 with uh, a capacity of 411, and Hampton would have a recommended enrollment of 553 with a capacity of uh, 648. 39 students were affected as a, as a part of this recommendation, and those are 39 students who currently go to Hampton Elementary who would live within this new Cromwell Valley boundary um, who would be rezoned to Cromwell Valley um, Elementary School. So the next steps, there will be a public hearing uh, held on November the 21st at 7 o'clock p.m. at Lock Raven High School. And then immediately following that, on December the 6th, the Board of Education will make the final decision regarding the boundary recommendations that we've proposed this evening. So at this particular point in time, if there are any questions regarding the boundary recommendations for Cromwell Valley. Thank you. Mr. Virch. Um, Mr. Gillis, uh, in his uh, area of representation, that's where Cromwell Valley is. Um, I have the adjoining area, and uh, there are students from my area, although the school's not in my area, there are students from my area who go there. Um, my understanding is that you, you said 39 Hampton students would be, would be impacted by this? Yes, sir, that is right? correct. And there may be about 100 students that, like, can walk to the school in the um, in the Cromwell Valley sort of yes sir you know, that is neighborhood that is correct so that then means that the balance are actually going to be students who would be applying through the magnet process uh, to go to the school so it's like 300 and some students yes sir that's now, correct you, call me Steve now you also said that you know there's this region and it's students across this region that can apply well, when Ed and I went to the briefing on Monday, uh, we were told Penelope's going to have a schematic of what that's going to look like. So I wanted to ask you if you have anything to share with Ed and I as to what the region is, or is this something to, co to follow after we have our input from our stakeholders and folks at, at our upcoming meeting? So may I ask for clarification, when you indicate region, are you talking about specific schools that would be impacted in terms of applying for the magnet program, or are here's, you talking here's about... Here's what I'm asking. I'm asking for what uh, the planning folks said you would define and what you use across the region. So whatever you say is across the region, just, just share with us what the region is. So the region would... Let me, let me see if I can kind of focus or help you focus on what the question is, because I was there too. Um, the discussion was on who can apply to which magnet schools, and there would be regional magnet schools instead of countywide magnet programs. So there are eight elementary schools in that area um, that would be able to apply to the, um, to the Cromwell Valley, and that would include Halstead Academy, Hampton Elementary, Oakley Elementary, Pleasant Plains Elementary, Rogers Forge Elementary, Stonely Elementary, Villa Cresta Elementary, and West Towson Elementary. So those are the students who would be able to apply to the magnet program at Cromwell Valley. And I want to thank you for clarifying just exactly what we wanted to answer to. Now what I'd like to ask you about is that it's not a secret that there, in fact, there is overcrowding in some of our, some of these elementary schools in this list of the eight that you just shared with us. Isn't that also true? <laughs> So, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Martinox, if I could also just uh, just chime in, Dr. Martinox is exactly right in terms of those lists of the eight schools that she listed for students who require transportation would be um, provided that transportation who apply from those particular schools. But because it is a centralized magnet, any student can apply uh, to attend Cromwell. Dr. White, thank you for sharing the answer to the unasked question. <laughs> 
If you know what the lottery number is going to be tonight, <laughs> oh, I'm okay with that too. Please feel free to share that. Uh, crank up the volume on that microphone. Um, the question I wanted to ask you, though, there's no anticipation that um, this across the region identified area, this is not going to significantly reduce in any way the overcrowding in these uh, overcrowded elementary schools in this list of eight. Is, is that, that, that's a safe statement to make. So the, the, the boundary study that took place was to reestablish the magnet program. It wasn't to address overcrowding in any of the schools. It was to establish that Walker area for and I'm fine with it. I just wanted to make sure that, that you know, this is, this is an effort to reduce overcrowding in these elementary schools. It's about defining a specific region from which students, in the, you know, elementary school students can then apply to Cromwell Valley. That's correct. Very good. <laughs> nice job, Dr. Brown. <laughs> now, if you have the pick three, Dr. Brown, that would be good, too. Ms. Quasi? <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, if you could flip back the presentation to uh, that has the state rate capacity of the schools, that would be great. Yes. Um, see. Okay. Because my questions are uh, dovetailing with um, Mr. Gillis and Mr. Virch about specifically um, how many students are projected to be in the Walker Zone, how many slots then are total open for magnet applications. Um, also, previously, there had been some of the empty classrooms turned into behavior, behavior program classrooms, and are those students going to be moved to another location, or are those uh, program and students going to stay at Cromwell Valley? So there were multiple questions that I yes. heard, so let me try and disaggregate that. So based on the information that's shared on the screen, what it looks like is at this particular point in time um, that there will be 25 slots available. As the students in fifth grade matriculate, we're talking about another 60 to 70 students or an, an extra 60 to 70 spots available, including the 25, which would give us about 85 um, to 95 uh, spots available. Um, in terms of the classroom, the availability because that classroom was um, adjusted to meet the needs of the students that would still be a classroom that would be available those students would not be removed or wouldn't be a part of the adjustment to go to another school okay and then you'll be accommodated I'm sorry okay great so year one approximately 25 slots for magnet year two 95 well, the 25 at this particular point in time is not including those current fifth graders who would matriculate out. Given their current enrollment with 60 to 70 students enrolled, that would include, because as they exit, that would give us another set of seats. So we're talking about the 25 that is presented here, plus those students who are currently sitting in seats at Cromwell Valley, um, which is about 60 to 70 students right now. Okay, so 25 and then, so 90 approximately. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and is there, what is the application for applying? Is it, it strictly lottery, and is there any preference given to the eight schools that could receive transportation? So they would go through the magnet process, which is um, policy in Rule 6400, and so they would apply, and it is based on lottery. If there are more students who apply for seats that, more seats than are available, then those remaining students would also go into the lottery as well. Um, but the schools that I just shared with Mr. Virch would be the schools that would be in that region who would identify students who could apply um, within that in that area, but students from across our school system could also apply. They just would not receive transportation under um, the magnet policy. Great, thank you. Welcome. All right, uh, Ms. Brett. Um, could you just explain for me the 39 students, the situation of the 39 students whose enrollment is being affected, what that means for them? Sure. Um, so the, the boundary that was established for Cromwell Valley, mm -hmm. within that boundary, 39 of those students currently attend Hampton Elementary School. So those 39 students would es essentially be impacted by the boundary change and that they would be reassigned to Cromwell Valley because they live inside the boundary. That doesn't exclude them from, from doing the terminal grade uh, uh, transfer process to lessen the impact on students. So by terminal grade process, what, what exactly do you mean? They can grandfather out and finish at Hampton? Yes, ma'am. I believe it's the rising um, two grades, the, the, the rising two grades, the so rising fourth and fifth graders. 
are eligible to continue to finish out their years at Hampton uh, versus move to the new school. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Is let, this? Let me know. Oh, please. Oh, great. Go ahead. Uh, and then, I mean, uh, Mr. Stewart, and then we'll get Mr. Okay. Birch again. So Just I, I, I think this will be fairly quick. But I noticed that in the demographic statistics with, re with respect to percent minority and free and reduced lunch, that Cromwell Valley is increasing by a few percentage points and, and Hampton is going down by a few percentage points. Is that just because of the reallocation of students between the two schools? At this particular point in time, yes, that would be the reallocation because those numbers are updated every year. Um, as students submit their information, um, we get a more definitive number around October 30th um, to determine which students fall under that category. But right now, those are the current percentages based on the adjustments that would take place. Yes, sir. So I guess my question, though, is the adjustments are because we're just redrawing those lines. So some students who used to go, for example, to uh, Hampton are going to go over to Cromwell and vice versa. That would be correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Birch. Thank you very much. The 39 can walk <coughs> to CVE. That's correct. Yes, sir. And right now, do, they, do those 39 walk or ride to Hampton? I think they ride, don't they? I, yeah, we, I don't think that they, they certainly can't walk to Hampton right, where say, they live. <laughs> yes, it's they, a bit of a, what's a bit of a hike? They, it's, they get some type of transportation, whether it's uh, from the school district or from their parents or some other method. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Quasi. Uh, the last question related to uh, students being grandfathered in through the terminal uh, grade process. Uh, if a family has, let's say, a kindergartner right now and a a fourth grader right now, does that kindergartner get to stay? We know the fourth grader gets to stay to do the fifth grade, but does that kindergartner get to stay then all the way through also? So what they would do is under 5410, they would apply for special permission to remain um, in that school. But what we try not to do is disrupt the sibling, sibling um, piece if they're students who are enrolled in the school, but they fall under 5410 for special permission. Okay. And how are those 39 potential families feeling? We we haven't um, we haven't heard a whole lot of um, we haven't heard a whole lot of resistance from from parents. I mean, there were some there were some concerns overall concerns with redistricting of splitting larger uh, neighborhoods. Uh, like the, I think it's the Campus Hills neighborhood is a larger, much larger area than what we have here, and so there was some concerns from the public about dividing that that neighborhood, but um, we haven't. At least I'm not that I'm aware of, haven't heard of any uh, feedback from those families yet. Thank you. All right. Any other questions at this time? All right. Thank you, Dr. Knox and Mr. Cropper. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Again, remind, uh, I'll make an announcement later, but that meeting, the hearing's on the 21st. Right. All right. Um, our next agenda item is. Uh, Public comment on policies. We have several policies, and we have uh, uh, a sign up for for most of them. Uh, Miss Moore is signed up. Marion Moore to sign up is signed up to speak on changes to policy 0100. That will be our first policy for the evening. And uh, policy 0100 is on uh, our philosophy on equity. Okay. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. First and foremost, I would like to suggest for policy 100 to add the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in legal references. That would be helpful, and that would help the protected groups under that particular um, Act. Since policy 100 is in the basic board commitment section, I suggest that the philosophy and definition should articulate how equity in education is just not student centered, but employee centered as well as economically centered for all schools. There should be more emphasis on the health and economics of employees in order to enhance the quality of education for students. 
For instance, you could add uh, a definition for employees stating providing each employee with what is necessary to achieve career satisfaction because we need to have balance between student and employee satisfaction in, uh, in order to meet academic and career goals. In addition, a definition for equity regarding economics could be providing each school and facility with what is financially necessary to address the socio-economical needs for each community regarding academic safety, communication, and organizational effectiveness. Further, this is a, another section of the equity policy. Um, we, we hear a lot about the lack of presence of African Americans in the classroom, uh, teachers. Uh, we've been informed by research that African Americans are resigning from the teaching profession. And I, I believe that we should track uh, the equity with, um, with recruitment, promotion, placement, and retention of African American teachers or employees, uh, which is uh, stated in guidelines F. You can measure by collecting data on the African American teacher to student ratio in each school within your districts. The Human Resource Department could track African American teachers' performance contributions and whether or not they're being recognized fairly. Also, implementing a focus group with African American teachers and leaders about their concerns related to how they're treated or managed or ignored at their assigned school. This can be done with all races and protected groups. Overall, the lack of African American teachers or lack of support within their career is an example of an inequity in education. Overall, the lack of African American teachers or lack of support within their careers, and I'm sorry, I said that already, <laughs> which, <laughs> which can impact African. Thank you, Ms. Moore. All right. Um, the next policy um, to be commented on is policy 0200, precepts, beliefs, and values of the Baltimore County public school system. Okay. okay. Um, and so basically what I was saying with the equity policy, you know, if we do make those, those ch um, changes, that that would impact not only African American students' performance, but the um, cultural sensitivity of non-black students and teachers or employees. Now, as far as policy 200, I also would recommend that you add in the legal requirements the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, in terms of um, balancing out morality with legality. I often hear leaders chanting uh, to lead with love, but what I've learned is that policies can limit love and put conditions on love. Some of these conditions can be race related, related to social status, zip code, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. As students, teachers, and leaders, we have to choose to lead with love, respect, and an unbiased heart. Let me share with you a story, a quick story, about some white leaders who showed me love, respect, and a caring heart. When I was in middle school, my standardized test scores uh, were a little below average. And basically, in Baltimore City in the 90s, if you did not perform well, that would determine what high school you would go to. And so uh, if your scores were low, you would go to your zone school. However, we had city-wide schools. So when I was in the eighth grade, I went, uh, we went on a field trip to Western High School, which is an all-girl public high school. The assembly was just so captivating this, um, to see uh, the young ladies and their sisterhood and, and their many uh, talents. I, I just wanted to be there. And uh, when I found out that uh, based on my standardized test scores, uh, basically it, I, I did not qualify to go to that school, I cried and I cried, I was upset. And my mother, she um, appealed it with the student placement office. And um, there were teachers, uh, counselors that advocated for me uh, based on my academics. And, um, and they were white. I had an interview with uh, uh, Ms. Whiten, who happened to be white too, who was the principal. And she didn't know me, but 
at that time, you know, she applied policy 200 and she gave me a chance. She gave me a chance to go to Western even though my standardized scores were low and that took love. That, you know, her taking out the time to just get to know me for that, vi that short amount of time and change my life so that I could um, compete and, and go to a, attend a school that uh, was well known for its academics and sports program. So I think you should do the same. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the next policy uh, for comment is policy 5551, students conduct gangs, gang activity, and similar destructive or illegal group behavior. Uh, I also would suggest to add the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, to this particular policy. Um, when I see uh, gangs in a title uh, or gang-related activities, uh, I know that my race is impacted by this particular policy. And that's one of the reasons why I just wanted to speak briefly about it. I'm, just, I'm not gonna read, let me just talk. I think I've graduated to just talking and not reading from the paper. Um, I think that this particular policy should be renamed. I think that, uh, I think that it's number five, I think it's number five in the guidelines now, and it talks about intervention programs and different things uh, that the superintendent, as well as the board, can do to accommodate and intervene with students who are in gangs. I think that um, prevention is very important and that that should be the focus. So why not change this title, students who need leadership development or support services, because that's really what they need. They just need, you know, uh, most kids join gangs because they, um, they may feel powerless, they may not feel loved at home, and they're just reaching out to other people that may relate to them um, and, and just feel a sense of belonging. And so that if we apply that um, as education leaders in the classroom, d despite race, religion, um, sexual orientation, and things of that nature, disability, then um, I think that that would reduce the amount of students that are partici participating in gangs. Intervention programs such as creative expression, um, trade programs, career development, these type of things can impact a child's life and, and, and steer them in a, um, a positive direction. This policy is also connected to the school to prison pipeline. And I think that in closing, we have to keep that in mind and really not label the kids as you know gang members and things like that, but students who need support services or leadership development. Thank you. And the um, last policy for comment is policy 8131, internal board policies, organization, administrative, and policy absence. I think this might have something to do with, because I really didn't, I looked, I scanned through the policy, but I'm, I think this has something to do with um, allowing a superintendent to make decisions in absence of the board. So if we add the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to this policy, then that would allow the superintendent to make more uh, decisions on equity without the help of the, or the management of the board. So he could intervene, for example, if he knows a student is being treated differently because that student has a disability or that child is African American or Hispanic. And that would give him the power to, um, you know, have zero tolerance for the arbitrary decisions that some leaders may have. And he, he can immediately um, stand his ground for all people. I believe he's capable of doing that. And so, uh, let's see. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Thank mm -hmm. you, Ms. Moore. <coughs> Nigel needs to go to bed. All right. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. Um, our next agenda item um, would be board committee updates. Uh, Mr. Yofelder, you have anything for tonight? Absolutely. Uh, 
Internal Audit Committee uh, met the last one, October 18th. Um, the main order of business was the presentation of the 2016 Comprehensive Annual Financial Audit and Single Audit uh, presented uh, by uh, Sherry King of Clifton Larson. Uh, board members will be receiving, I believe, for the next meeting, uh, a copy of the audited statements uh, of the CPFs. And then after that, as usual, we received uh, our quarterly information regarding uh, current and closed investigations. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Williams from the PRC. Thank you, good evening. The Policy Review Committee met on Monday, November 7th. Um, and I do just want to share publicly that there were some minor edits to um, policy 0100, um, but we uh, deemed those to be minor. And so when you get the third reader, it'll have the most recent version, even though the other version was still in the um, packet for tonight. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Um, our next meeting will be held on December 12th at 5.30. The meeting is open to the public and our agenda will be posted on the school system's website approximately one week prior to the meeting. Thank you. I don't know, Ms. Miller or Mr. Do you have anything on safety and technology? I've sure. Heard. On November 1, Mrs. Miller and I attended the Safety and Technology Committee. Um, it's uh, chaired by uh, our Chief Academic Officer, Verlita White. We had uh, three areas of discussion, uh, the first being a discussion of the social media guidelines, uh, the second being uh, training, uh, which began in October on growing up digital and the updated website um, uh, in that regard, and the third being a report on health guidance for digital classroom uh, work group, uh, a work group uh, composed of medical professionals and others. Uh, so we were, uh, I was pleased to uh, hear uh, reports on all of those areas. Thank you. Can I add a little bit yes, to that? Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, the, the health work group's recommendations, um, they touched on a lot of areas uh, of health concerns related to screen use. It was short at this point on setting recommendations on screen time limits but I think that that will begin to develop as they continue the, their work and they are intending to meet again. Um, let's see, we are still working on reviewing BCPS contracts which include data sharing to see how many are not under the new data, data sharing agreement yet. Um, I also have been asking for estimates or a survey on how much time students spend on their devices at school uh, but we've not made any progress with the committee on that request. Um, it was suggested that to get that information, the board may have to direct the central office to conduct a survey. Uh, so that's one item the board should start considering, um, hopefully uh, in the near future. And the next, the next meeting is December 14th. Thank you, uh, Ms. Miller. Um, Ms. Quasi. For Mr. Gillis about the Safety and Technology Committee meeting, if I could. Yep. Uh, Mr. Gillis, I was just wondering um, uh, how far along is the Safety and Technology Committee in working with uh, the modifications to 6202 and the social media uh, policy for teachers and staff? Yeah, so we, uh, w that wasn't part of the agenda that we had this past meeting, and I'm uh, I don't know whether that is something that's on the next meeting agenda. Okay, would you mind checking on that and sure. thank you. All right, I think that is it for our board up, uh, committee updates. Uh, our next agenda item is uh, board member comments. Uh, I'm gonna try to start in the middle of the group <laughs> with Mr. Yulfelder. Do you have any? Yeah, I, I just, just, something that for some time ha, has uh, bothered me and I think adds to the length of our meeting, and that is the redundancy uh, in buildings and contracts. Uh, it, it would be really beneficial um, if everybody could get here for the entire buildings and contracts committee because the same questions that are asked during the committee meeting are almost the same questions that are asked uh, during the presentation. And also, uh, and, and there are some members of the board who abide by this, 
uh, to get all the questions in uh, to Mr. Dixit and Mr. Cyrus prior to the, to the uh, board, to the uh, contract meeting so that uh, they can be fully answered during their presentation. And I think if we do that, we will cut down the amount of time that we're spending in the presentations here at the full board. So I would urge everybody to try and get to the full building and contracts committee. Also, if that's not possible, I've suggested that perhaps there's some way that we could have uh, the committee meeting uh, in, absorb, absorbed within our total meeting. And I think that's something we ought to take a look at so that we only have one go around uh, on the uh, contracts and uh, that are presented. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey, if we could move in that direction, we'll, we'll skip anyone. Certainly. I have a number of things that I wanted to say. I'm going to cut it down because of the uh, time the time tonight, how late it is. Um, number one, I did want to say that Veterans Day is this Friday and schools will be in session. So hopefully there'll be an absorb, uh, observance uh, of the many who have served in the military and currently serve to protect the freedom and rights we as Americans enjoy, including yesterday when we had nationwide elections. And no matter what happened and who's happy and unhappy, there'll be a peaceful transfer of power because our uh, democratic experience experiment is still working. Um, in terms of grading, I wanted to say that I'm in support of Ms. Baton's letter to the editor. The adverse impacts of new grading and reporting procedurals manual that were implemented in August before school started are not the fault of the teachers or the principals. Issues with grading and reporting procedures that are negatively affecting students, teachers, and families are from the lack of effective leadership. One of the great um, the comments that I heard from people that I've been talking to about this is that no one is owning this. And I appreciate Dr. Dance in his um, superintendent's report stating that there are things that were missed and that they're going to work to um, continue to work to improve that. Um, but it's leadership from Superintendent Dance, uh, the central office staff, and the board. Um, there is this myth of collaboration, and um, I just have to say it's disappointing. Um, I've heard Abby, um, Ms. Baton pointed it out that teachers asked for a draft of the manual early last year and did not receive it. Uh, I know I personally asked for the um, manual at uh, a board meeting, and it was not uh, given, given to us. Um, and just to set the timeline straight, it, there was a brief part of it given to the curriculum committee on June 15th, um, but the whole um, manual was ready June 21st when teachers were already gone for the summer and the principals received the manual for the first time. So I think that we really, as leaders, need to really own this and not send the parents to the teachers who are not able to make changes to the, to the procedures without getting direction from the leadership. So, um, and I appreciate the modifications that were made that we got copies of at our desk today. I'm gonna to look through those, but I have already received comments on them from parents and, uh, that are concerned about they are not going to affect the negative grades that many students are experiencing for the first quarter. So I think what really needs to be evaluated is what can be done. A suggestion was made uh, that teachers could calculate the grades for the first quarter, both using modifications and not give the student the benefit of the better grade. Another uh, concern that I've heard about is student eligibility for sports coming up in the winter, and maybe the staff and the superintendent can consider uh, an adjustment where students' grades can either be considered for first quarter or for last year's fourth quarter in terms of giving those students the opportunity to participate in sports, which is healthy and important for our students, and also for some of them it's a, a part of them getting into college. College. Um, there's other areas where there has been uh, this myth of collaboration um, where supposedly stakeholder input is taken into consideration and yet it's been years and years ongoing where in fact it's not. And that includes lack of air conditioning, lack of clean water, uh, the Cromwell Valley Magnet Program, which thankfully we heard about tonight, was on hold for two years or so despite um, community input, safety and technology. We're still waiting to hear screen time. We're still waiting for a social media policy. School discipline we heard about in our advisory council dinner. So I would really suggest that we 
utilize the, the paths that we have, including our surveys, to really give the parents and the teachers and the students a mechanism to give us the feedback we need to make the policies and help govern the school system so that we can improve it for every student. And that's all I'm going to say tonight. Thank you. Ms. Williams. I just want to publicly thank Abby Baton for her advocacy on behalf of teachers. Um, she really does work very hard behind the scenes, um, and, and I appreciate the, the time that uh, she spends working with the board and um, talking with individual board members. And I just wanted to publicly thank her for that. Mr. Stewart. I'll just echo that and say we continue to need your input as a board on this policy. And so please continue to advocate as I know you will. Um, but I also want to say that since uh, the last meeting, I had an opportunity to sit down with the leadership of Baltimore Highlands Elementary School uh, and to take a tour of that school. And so I want to thank Principal Williams and his team for their time. Um, and what I saw there was a vision of a school community that's open and responsive, data-driven, and, and focused on the whole child. Uh, I saw teachers and staff who had eternalized that vision, who make it real each day with their work and their effort, and in the way that they treat each child as special and valuable. And I saw students from different cultures and different backgrounds, sometimes with different languages, all engaging with one another. And in a way, what I saw was remarkable. It stands in stark contrast to a darker trend reflected in our national politics, and one that suggests that we should be scared of our differences and should use them in a cynical way to advance our own interests. And so to the folks of the Southwest area, I'd like to say that despite what you hear in some corners at the national level, this is not our county and is not our area. We are different. We remain committed to the belief that our diversity is our strength, that multicultural education leads to better grades and better outcomes and a better understanding of one another. And we still need your help each day to make that real wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Birch. Thank you. Uh, just a small matter of clarification. Um, it's been said that uh, schools are open on Friday. Well, that's true. High schools and middle schools are, but our elementary schools are closed for the marking period. There you go. You can talk to the chief of staff as to whether it's a marking period or not. Um, secondly, um, yeah, the American Education Week is next week, and I'll be out uh, visiting some of our schools. Um, it's really a kind of a pleasant uh, diversion from the board meetings and the evening and all this. You get, you get into the schools and you see the high energy kids and the uh, high energy uh, teachers who are trying to keep up, it's, uh, it's really a good place to be, and there's a lot to take from those, those good mm -hmm. schools. And it is a marked contrast to the dystopian uh, reference that, uh, that Nick was referring to in his comments. I do welcome his comments. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Ms. Miller? I wanted to thank the leadership of the AEACs, the Area Education Advisory Councils, um, for coming out and meeting with the board this evening. We had dinner together and, and it was really good to hear their comments um, during the board meeting. The uh, advisory councils are the conduit for citizens to give input to the board on topics of concern as they choose them and as they identify them. So I want to encourage that further growth and keep come on, coming out. We'd love to hear from you at the board meetings. Um, also, um, I wanted to ask that, and we discussed this during our meeting, that please email your pre-budget requests to all the board members. It would be helpful for us to be able to see those uh, comments. Um, also, I wanted to respond to uh, Mr. Yulfelder's comment about the um, Building and Contracts Committee. I think rather than incorporating it into our meetings, which would shorten the amount of time between when contracts are introduced and when we're voting on them, we really should expand that amount of time. So they can still meet prior to our uh, regular board meetings, but it should be for, we don't vote on those in, until the next board meeting. So it would give us two weeks then 
where then we could have minutes that could be submitted, all the board members could see it, we'd have time to ask those questions, and that would take care of the um, issue that Mr. Yulefelder addressed. Uh, and that's it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Ms. Johnson? Yes, thank you. So I also want to th thank the Office of Academics for listening to the teachers, the parents, TABCO, Abby specifically, and, and everybody that worked so hard for her. So thank you for making those changes and tweaks to the policy um, and really being reactive and, and, and listen, showing that you are listening to, to the students and the teachers. Um, you know, we have an amazing system here. I've gotten to know a lot of the people that work for the system, um, the students, the, the, the parents, the teachers, and so much so that we were watching a movie the other day and my kids swear that Dr. Dance and Kevin Hart are the same person and they're so proud <laughs> that, <laughs> that that is their superintendent. Uh, <laughs> but I did want to say, so you know, as I was putting these kids to bed last night, I was telling them, you know, they are asking me what is what's what's going on I said don't worry we are stronger together and um, so we woke up this morning and they had more questions and they asked what now and so I'm gonna share what I shared with them it was def definitely not this eloquent when I shared it with this, them this morning um, and I was able to share it with them after um, kind of conferring with and talking with some people that I consider very good friends and, and, and good they gave me good input and positive uh, reinforcement so um, I make a promise to you to continue to fight for all of our children, to be brave and bold enough to identify what all really means. I make a promise to honor the outcome of last night, but I will continue to fight against bigotry. I will stand by our Muslim families, by our same-sex parent families, by our gay students, our black families, our female students, our farms families, our immigrant families, our Latino families, our disabled children, and our native students. I will lead by example on how to be responsibly involved and civic-minded. I will show you how to engage in conversation, not just for the sake of winning, but for the sake of understanding each other. I will teach you the power of fact-checking and doing your homework, whether it's graded or not, and I will teach you how foolish you look when you act and speak on your own biases. I will continue to teach you to be kind and not to bully and to leave this planet better than when I arrived. So I was, had the pleasure of being in um, New York this past weekend and I got to see Hamilton for my birthday. Whoa. And so, yeah, so, um, <laughs> so just like my country, I'm young, scrappy and hungry and I'm not gonna give up my shot. So thank you for, thank you to the governor for the opportunity to even be able to sit here. And thank you for this platform that I have to finally three years in share my, my thoughts and my ideas. And um, thank you, Mr. Collins. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Collins, you're up. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to thank <clears throat> Marisol uh, for that nice remark, Dallas for his very generous remarks, and uh, my friends from the Muslim community as well. <clears throat> and like so many of you tonight, I briefly, trying not to be redundant, wanted to comment on the um, grading situation. When I read the article last Friday, I grabbed it and put it aside to make sure I could bring it in today. I was really distressed when I read the article last Friday. I'm so glad to read Abby's letter, which clarified <clears throat> many of my concerns as reflected in the article. I certainly agree that we need to um, attempt to have our grades be as reflective as they can be of what our students know. But Abby was too generous in her last paragraph. She simply said, our teachers are the true education experts. We have many ideas about how to improve this policy. I've heard dozens upon dozens of them when I visit schools and talk with teachers every day. And I hope we have the opportunity to make the ideas of our teachers a reality. You've heard me before mention the Massachusetts uh, Education Act in 1647, which established public schools. Since then, teachers have been evaluating students and giving them grades. Probably the last thing we need in our system is a policy at all, which is telling teachers 
how to evaluate their students. They know better than we do here in the central administration without a doubt. I mean, that, is an in, that has to be indisputable. However, down the path we go with good intentions. I know the intentions are good. I've spoken to the Dr. Dance about it briefly, and I know Verlita is a real leader and an enormously good and decent educator and person. So I know that you think you're doing the right thing, but I really believe that if you put out some guidelines in a page or two to teachers and say, think about these factors if you're not already thinking about them as a way to evaluate your students to be sure that they are in fact learning and that the grade is reflecting that learning. The teachers know how to evaluate their kids and they know their kids. And to give them a, I don't know exactly how, in, how involved, Abby said it's a lot of extra work, to give them extra busy work or other types of uh, reporting relative to how they're arriving at their grades is really an insult to them. And it's a detriment to the system. Our teachers, in addition to being our true education experts, from time immemorial, you should have put in there, Abby, have been evaluating their students and they know when the students know and they know how to reflect that in a grade. So by all means, I will say Abby's la part of Abby's last sentence, I hope we have the opportunity to make the ideas of our teachers reality. I certainly do too because they know what they're doing and have known for a long time. And I, uh, in this penultimate <laughs> meeting of my career on the board, I wanted to do what I've done for five and a half years one more time and stick up for the teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to use this time very briefly to uh, thank my good friend Senator Collins for his five and a half years of service on this board. Uh, we are going to miss the Lion of Kenwood. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, before I go through them, we neglected to recognize we have some principals here from Cromwell Valley and uh, Hampton Elementary. We have Miss Patricia Kaiser from Hampton Elementary School and Miss Kathy Thomas from Cromwell. Would you st stand for us? Thank you for all your work at those great schools and uh, we are happy to have you with us this evening. As has been said before, American Education Week is November 14th through 18th. The public hearing, as we talked about on Cromwell Valley, is Monday, November 21st at 7 p.m. at Lock Raven High School. And our next board meeting is, no, is Tuesday, November 22nd, 6.30 here at Greenwood. We're now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please don't forget to sign the orders here.